So they said I should stand right here. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Rachel Carson Center uh, for having me. I was here uh, a few years ago also for a conference uh, on oil, so this must not be the first time uh, that the Rachel Carson Center approaches the topic. And obviously, uh, the Managing Scarcity Project uh, uh, based at uh, Maastricht uh, University. Uh, and also, I must admit, uh, I have to thank you because yesterday, as some of you might know, was the National Morning Day uh, in Italy for the death of Silvio Berlusconi. And I'm actually happy that I was not there. <laughs> <laughs> to be uh, part of that moment because, uh, as some of you might know, politically Berlusconi was a very diverse, divisive figure, even though personally, obviously, we we're all unhappy for uh, his death. Uh, so uh, here I will try to uh, launch some ideas uh, on oil and the environment, uh, which more or less uh, is the topic of the ongoing conference. But uh, I will focus on what I know a little bit more, which is uh, uh, geopolitics, uh, which is uh, understandably marginal in most of the papers that have been presented in this conference. So the advent of a so-called green economy uh, is often presented as equaled with the rise uh, of a new age of light, if you will, uh, after the dark ages of fossil fuels. Uh, this, uh, in some ways, plays uh, into the argument first raised, or at least raised uh, uh, at an international level by Tim Mitchell's uh, highly discussed uh, carbon democracy, where specifically the role of oil uh, uh, is linked to uh, the rise of the dollar as an imperial currency, uh, the idea of infinite growth of the economy, the decline of workers' movements, and uh, the rise of authoritarian governments, not only in oil exporting countries. So this uh, dichotomy from my point of view between green, so renewable resources, uh, decarbonization, and black, uh, the carbon economy, but mostly oil, tends to downplay, and that is the risk, the enduring role uh, of fossil fuels, uh, and in particular of oil to this day, and the inevitable legacies of this carbon economy even in a post-carbon world. And here I give you just one example. As we all want to move towards uh, electric vehicles, most of you probably know that these electric vehicles rely on plastics, which is, anyway, a, a, a derivative from petroleum, much more than cars with combustion uh, en engines. But I think this dichotomy also hides uh, uh, important lessons that could actually be derived from the so-called uh, age of oil. Uh, because the emergence of oil, which became the most important primary energy source, uh, more or less in the 50s, beginning of the 1960s, in the 20th century, this story includes the end of colonial empires, the emergence of welfare states and of the so-called New Deal regime, rising standards of living, at least where we are now, uh, in Germany and in Western Europe. And obviously, needless to say, all of this went in parallel with massive environmental uh, degradation and the spread of consumerism. So what I will do here is, is I will focus on a key episode uh, 
uh, of the age of oil and of the so-called great acceleration that went with it, the 1973 oil shock. In a few months, it will be the 50th anniversary uh, of the shock. And this episode, from my point of view, embodied many of the contradictions of the carbon economy, but also constituted an opportunity, a moment for structural change. So how is it best to uh, interpret what happened in 1973? Uh, if you leave aside the conspiracy theories that actually abound uh, in uh, my own country, Italy, but also in France, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, as it being a machination of big oil to increase prices uh, because everything that happens in the world needs to be explained because or uh, with the involvement of the US government or the involvement of some US corporations. And if you leave aside a relatively marginal episode, which you normally find in history textbooks, which is the oil embargo, which was quite insignificant from the point of view of the increase uh, in oil prices, I think <coughs> Uh, the oil shock can be interpreted basically as a manifestation of three underlying structural processes. The first of these structural process is the crisis of a growth regime and of a developmental model, if you will. At the end of the 1960s, both Venezuela and the United States, Venezuela being from 1929 to 1969 the largest oil exporter in the world, so it was the Saudi Arabia of its time, and the United States being to this day the largest oil producer uh, uh, in the world, actually once again became the largest oil producer in the world relatively recently. So at the end of the 1960s, both these two key countries for oil uh, reached peak production, and this seemed to re reveal the practical possibilities of limits to natural resource extraction. While at the same time, the a devastating impact of industrial pollution became a widely debated argument uh, of political struggle, and this is the right place actually to talk about this, uh, both in industrialized countries and internationally. So this, this is the first structural change of the end of the 60s, be, be, beginning of the 1970s. The second structural change uh, is that the old shock embodied the effort to overcome what is now called, defined as an equal ecological exchange, but was then called with a different term, uh, structural dependence of raw materials uh, uh, exporters. Peter O'Dell, who was at the time one of the key energy, you know, one of the gurus on energy, there's always a guru of uh, energy in the different decades. Peter O'Dell was such uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, he, uh, I think, accurately describes the shock of Western observers when viewing the cooperation among raw materials exporters to change the terms of trade. And the beginning of the 1970s was actually the time in history where the divide among countries in terms of their wealth was uh, the highest, even higher than in colonial times. So Peter Odell argues, and I'm here I'm quoting him, it, the shock, appears to stem from an unwillingness to accept the idea that there has been a revolutionary change in the world of oil, uh, um, in the world of oil, power, and to face the fact that for the first time in 400 years, there has been a loss of control by, West, by the Western world over an essential element in its system and to, to, to a set of countries which have hitherto considered to be decision-taking entities. So there is this shift 
uh, 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 this effort to overcome this uh, unequal ecological exchange. And third, which is something very few people point out, is that the oil shock, the increase in prices, is paralleled at the end of the 1960s by an enormous activism of labor movements across industrialized countries. Here you have you know, the number of strikes in the United States, but if you look at Western Europe, it's actually more. The labor movement acted as a countervailing force to capitalism, to use the terms that has been used even recently by uh, US historian Charles Meyer. This led to a massive boost of salaries and of improvement of working standards, which resulted throughout industrialized countries with a massive increase in consumption in the end of the 1960s, uh, uh, early 70s. And this put pressure on uh, uh, oil production that was at least perceived to be in trouble uh, 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 by the uh, beginning of the 1970s. So all of these three structural processes, pressures, if you will, on geopolitics, on the geopolitics of resources, gave rise to debates and initiatives uh, at the national and at the international level that, while they were unsuccessful, as we know now, uh, remain relevant to this day. And I'll hint to this in the conclusion. In the first places, in the first place, the crisis of the growth regime was paralleled with an emerging debate on degrowth, what we now call degrowth. Elite-driven institutions such as the Club of Rome that was founded in 1968, radical intellectuals such as Ivan Illich, but also key policy makers such as the Dutch Socialist President of the European Commission at the time in 1972, Sikko Mansolt, they all agreed that the politics of productivity, to use once again a term used by Charles Meyer, had done its time, and that at least in the West, a new model that moved beyond growth in material out output had to be conceived. But what is interesting is that also oil technocrats, this is particularly the case of Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, uh, one of the two founding uh, Venezuelan uh, technocrats, one of the two founding fathers of OPEC, which I've studied uh, a lot, but also, uh, weirdly, the Iranian uh, minister for the economy, so who actually took care also of the oil sector, uh, Jamshid uh, uh, Amuzegar, uh, who was, even though most of you probably have not n ever heard about it, the key figure in deciding the price increases in oil in 1973. While these two people differed uh, on uh, internal uh, economic and political policies in their own countries, they both agreed that there was a need to curb what they called overconsumption in the West by making it pay dearly for a natural resource. And here I have a quote that I've taken from my bo book, which is based mostly on the minutes of the OPEC conferences, which is the place where these ministers actually dealt with each other to take decisions. And this is how Jamshid Amuzegar uh, explains the decision to double and then double once again the prices of oil uh, in 73. He says, when passing through the famous city of the highly industrialized countries of the world, and he thought all of them had visited these places, they had no doubt found that the skyscrapers were completely sealed off, it being impossible to open a window. In addition to central heating and air conditioning, there was usually a 24-hour ventilation system. Why, he asked, because it was cheaper to use oil as a fuel to provide this 24-hour ventilation than to have doorknobs, open windows, etc. This, he said, was what the affluent societies of the world did if provided with cheap oil. And this is what had indeed happened over the last 25 years. They were now awaiting that humanity and posterity would stop the waste of this precious premium natural resource. So the effort to curb overconsumption 
which to a certain extent succeeded because it is worth noting that possibly one of the only times in history uh, maybe only paralleled with the period after the COVID uh, recession in 2020 where there was a significant decline in the use of oil in many parts of the world actually except for the United States at least in the, t in the, in the time uh, was after the oil price increases of 1973 and because of the price increases of 1973 and the, the, the decisions that were taken in certain countries to diversify their energy systems. Secondly, the effort to rebalance the other structural change and equal economic, ecological exchange led to practical proposals mm -hmm. such as the Common Fund for Commodities. The peak of this effort came with the U United Nations Declaration on the establishment of a new international economic order in April 1974, an initiative that was actually led by a country of OPEC, uh, Algeria, and that was predicated on some form of alliance. Eric Kissinger, the Secretary of State, used to call it the unholy alliance between oil producers and the rest of third world countries. Uh, OPEC spearheaded the push by developing countries for the creation of a, an in international commodity agreements to increase and at the same time to stabilize the prices of uh, commodities. The idea was that global commodity markets had to become more political more organized, basically state-to-state -state affairs that marginalize commercial mid middlemen and finance. This, in a way, could be represented in this scheme of a, uh, you know, of, of, a, of a different way of interpreting international diplomacy in the 20th century, whereby the actors are not the act normal actors of the Cold War, but they are, are actors that deal with natural resources. So you, you have sovereign landlords, OPEC on one hand, fossil capitalism, so international oil companies on the other hand, and then you had sovereign consumers which try to cooperate through international organizations such as the International Energy Agency. Finally, the rise of the labor movement went hand in hand with a weird de facto alliance between these sovereign landlords and workers' movements. In recent academic literature, there is a lot of attention to capital for the way it triggered climate change through technology or political power. And here I'm referring to books such as Capitalocene by Jason Moore or uh, uh, Fossil Capital by Andreas Malm. But it is important to note that in 1973, the parallel rise of trade unions and sovereign landlords, so countries such as Venezuela, Algeria, or Saudi Arabia, came mostly at the expense of fossil capital that was stripped of some of its most productive regions in the world, so all of these countries nationalized oil productions, while it was very difficult for energy companies to increase the price of energy, for example, electricity or, or natural gas, because the governments blocked every price increases, so the companies were the ones that uh, has to pay, had to pay. Bruno Latour, the French philosopher, in his latest book before he died recently, uh, argues that uh, to understand who belongs to the, what he calls the new ecological class, one should be able to respond to this question. And the question is this, and it's a clever question. Who do you feel closest to and who do you feel very remote from when discussions touch upon matters of the ecology? So my point is that in 1973, sovereign landers, and to a certain, ex to a certain extent, were part of this ecological uh, class, as weird as this might sound. Obviously, there was a pushback against these novelties. Degrowth never really gained enough supporters. It was vilified by neoliberal economists, Robert Solow famously uh, 
argued in response to the report of the Club of Rome on the, on the limits to growth that the world can in effect get along with natural, without natural resources. Also the growth paradigm morphed into in a different guise a sustainable development which is premised on the possibility of balancing material growth in output with uh, uh, ecological uh, uh, boundaries. Even though, frankly, to this day, there does not seem to be much uh, evidence of the possibility of separating uh, increased material output from uh, increasing global resource extraction. Also, the Common Fund for Commodities, which was conceived uh, by the UN in 1974, predicated on international commodity agreements, on buffer stocks, on price controls, something actually that Keynes had already argued for during the negotiations of Bretton Woods uh, uh, in, during the Second World War, was marginalized, and I would argue, in a way, eliminated uh, from uh, international political discussion with the debt crisis of the 1980s that weakened cooperation between global South countries, but it was, it was even rendered irrelevant by the financialization of commodity markets and the rise of the so-called futures markets, which is commodity markets financialized. Also, the solidarity between oil producers and other raw materials exporters and, I mean, let's say, between oil exporting countries and developing countries basically disappeared. If you read the newspapers this day, it is hard to find an evidence of oil exporting countries actually supporting uh, countries of the so-called Global South, even though it must be noted that reading the same headlines and reading the fact that some of these countries, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, or Algeria, want to join BRICS, you could virtually say that to a certain extent this echoes some of the, 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 the ideas that were present in the 1970s. Also, sovereign landlords uh, remain to this day very powerful and very rich. Here you have a list of the so-called sovereign wealth fund and underlined it's the number of those that belong to countries that are oil exporting countries. So still these countries are among the richest countries in the world. The largest sovereign fund in the world will be the sovereign fund uh, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia of overcoming the sovereign fund of, uh, of Norway, which is another uh, oil and gas exporting country. It's actually it's the largest uh, natural gas exporter to the European Union. Uh, but this increasing importance even to this day actually is not uh, in conflict with international oil companies, but it's hand, to, hand in hand with international oil companies that as you have seen in 2022, big oil companies had their largest profits uh, in recent uh, history. And it seems actually that these sovereign landlords are not allied with, with, with labor in any way. They, have, they are seen as attempting the standards of living of the middle class and playing an intrusive political influence that favors authoritarian governments. And this is obviously uh, true in the case or visible uh, to some extent in the case of Russia. So let me conclude by saying that as we move uh, towards uh, uh, decarbonization, which requires a massive electrification uh, of energy systems, so investments in renewable subgrid, the question to me is to what extent the geopolitics of the green economy represents this advent of the golden age or to what extent it revives or embodies once again some of the unresolved conflicts 
and debates that emerged in 1973. First of all, the need to reduce material up output, so the question of degrowth in a way. Second of all, the, the need to stabilize the prices of commodities and of minerals that are critical for the energy transition so as to tackle the question of an equal econo ecological ex exchange because in some ways it feels that you know, these new critical materials such as lithium or cobalt they are even more concentrated than oil production is. And so many of the questions that OPEC had to face will, in a way, be translated to the debates between these new cr critical mineral resource exporting countries. And finally, there still is a need to protect uh, the wage earners, the workers, and the middle class that suffer disproportionately from energy transition while most of the emissions are produced by the richest sectors of society. So this is an enormous change with the 1970s. In the 1970s, still most of the emissions uh, dependent from where country people were from, today they depend from uh, 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 huge inequalities that exist within the countries. And finally, and to conclude and to, to interact with uh, you know, the key topics of this conference is that a different set of <coughs> questions, one that has been raised here, is to what extent the oil industry, so fossil capital in other terms, uh, uh, that uh, uh, has been seen as basically dragging its feet, to say the least, on most of these initiatives, could actually be part of the solution through diversification to technological innovation, financing climate adaptation, something that he was apparently already doing before today, even from the 1970s, but still the question, going back to the greenwashing, is debates we had uh, in the hours before, uh, to what extent this industry is so tied to the profits generated by the fossil order, by the fossil fuel order, that he will not be able to play any credible uh, and positive role. Thank you.